mate, this is going to be sort of an episode of Someone in Insight. <laughs> Keyword sort of like, spoiler, it's not live, so that's already given you a clue. It's not a normal episode. And then, spoiler, it's not, look at the time length. It's not three hours long. So it's not going to be the usual Summoning Insight, but it's going to be an episode under the Summoning Insight umbrella because on Summoning Insight and Monty stream during Worlds, people will have seen that we made the Big Dick Energy Trophy, the one with the big eggplant with, like, well, the lawyers would rather I don't say this, but let's just say anime-esque hair. I won't say the specific anime maybe we're all reminded of because in a court of law, I'm not reminded of any specific anime. What are you talking about? Sir? So anyway, we've got those. So we're going to give those away. And also we're going to talk about some off-season stuff because we're trying to make a different approach. We're not just having us have an off-season as well when everyone else is playing. league. So obviously this show, though, is brought to you by Esports Bet, the industry's leading crypto odds matrix. In fact, you'll see in a second some of the big dick energy player trophies we're going to giveaway will be to people who did indeed made bets now if you've never made a bet on esports bet before they have two deposit options if you're a first time depositor one is just the classic 50 percent on up to 200 usdt you do the math on that depends how much up to the 200 usdt you put in doesn't it and then the other one which is actually i think it's a pretty good one but this is like a good one in my opinion when obviously the season's going on it's the bet forgiveness one you can technically do it on any esport by the way it doesn't actually have to be league of legends i guess people are unaware that could be any anything that they have listed on the website in fact i'll even throw this in there if you're watching this right now they have World Cup, not as in FIFA the game, like the actual real World Cup you can make bets on. So what I would say is this, for the bet forgiveness one, the best angle on that one is obviously since you're going to get your original stake back up to 100 USDT, if you lose, betting on an underdog would usually be the best tip, I would say. So pick me, if you're going to do a World Cup game, pick one where someone's like a 2.5 or 3 underdog. Then if you lose, you go to the Esports Bet Discord, discord.gg slash esports bet. You message the mod mail, say last three nations sent you, you come up for the bet forgiveness, they'll give you the original stake back and obviously if you won you're laughing anyway aren't you because you're going to get more from the multiplier so okay that's that stuff out of the way right we, we did technically as I say on these shows we have actually already mentioned the big detention one because we've already given two of them away if you remember we gave one to right, here's the problem because didn't we give one to Showmaker Showmaker that was right for the Dan one versus Gen G series right and he obviously and did that, that was... amazing play on Sway and that was it yes exactly Exactly. And then the, the semifinal was uh, Faker because he had the incredible like rise games. That yes, outplayed. that was it. Uh, yes. So, yeah, it was uh, two two mid laners. But we hadn't since we haven't done a summoning insight since yes. the conclusion of Worlds, we haven't actually given it to one of the world's winners or, you know, it's, a, it's just a big dick energy trophy. It could go to the team that loses to uh, that's that's certainly in the cards. Um, but, it's worth pointing out though is I do not remember this detail because we already went over this before so I'll reiterate it now one thing people were getting confused by is this isn't like a player of the series award so for example right. when you hear those names you might ask how did they get to the final and Zeka didn't win one because we're actually specifically making it like a specific play in this case so as Monty says there was obviously that insane faker play with the Azir alt there was the one of um, Showmaker on the Swain the problem in the Zeka case is just he didn't have one like big star and out highlight player that was so great. It was more his overall player. So we're going to give away another one, obviously from the final, someone can win one a player. But then we're also going to give away, as we alluded to on the streams, we're actually going to give some of these awards to fans of the show who made doesn't have to be crazy, but let's just say impressive bets. I mean, in this particular case, it's a big Dick Engine award. Obviously, big balls bets is sort of what we're going for here. <laughs> exactly. Like ones where we, yeah, out. exactly. <laughs> so first of all, let's do the player then. So obviously for the final, this is actually a tough one, I think, for the final. Because was there like a big standout player that you think counts for this? So I think for me, like Kingen was, was rightfully the MVP of this series. I don't think he was the MVP of of Worlds, which is a different discussion because I think he really stepped up, especially in a matchup that was really not supposed to go his way oh. when he was playing against Zayas. So it was overcoming this uh, extremely fierce competition that he had, as well as having an outstanding series in his own right. I think if you talk about the Worlds overall MVP, it has to go to, to Zeka, uh, probably, even though he... Obviously, he was good in this series, uh, but it wasn't like he he transcended no, no. in the same way and dominated like Kingen did, especially holding down T1's most important threat with Zayas, I think was was really huge. Now, I think there's a couple different ways you can go about this. Barrel is an interesting one just because of his barred pick in game five of this series. That's a now, pretty ballsy pick as well, game five of World's Finals. I know that's pretty legit, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so here's what I'm going to say about Barrel. 
Now, people, if you look at his play in that game on Bard, it's not the best Bard game that we've ever seen, not by a long shot. But it's kind of an off-meta pick. Wow. And it was extremely good into T1's composition yes. with Faker on Victor and Gumiyushi on the Varus. So you have to remember that when we contextualize Beryl's decision, where we know that Varus had risen to like first pick blue side priority throughout this series, it was hotly contested by both teams. And so to say, okay, I'm going to take the Bard, which can help shut down these low mobility carries in Victor and Varus by using ultimate, you know, by attacking that back line. I think there's there's a lot to be said about how big dick energy this was, which is it is a good pick. But was Beryl really practicing this or was it like, so oh, oh, Varus has suddenly ascended to this huge priority. This is a very good pick into Varus. Are we going to pull it out now? How much had Beryl actually practiced this pick is, is a huge question. So people will say, oh, well, it wasn't a very impressive Bard game. But the thing is, Bard in this game changed the way that T1 had to play. And you can't underrate that. So even though it wasn't like an in-game big dick energy play, it was a huge dick energy pick. Uh when your entire going, year is on the line. I'm going from memory here, but I'm almost sure, Monty, when I listened to one of those like comms videos of this match, that in like the pregame for game five, it was even like Deft who told him something like, you could take Bard here or something, which in itself, by the way, is mental. <laughs> the idea that A, a fucking Caitlin ADC player is going, pick Bard for our world championship game. But also B, the idea like, roll that into what you're saying here. Dude, that's even more big dick that he picked it. Imagine someone yeah. suggesting you pick Bard and you go, Yes, why don't we just gamble our whole world championship on me picking Bard? Because obviously that could go totally terribly wrong, couldn't it? But yeah, that I actually agree, Monty. It's not even about that he did like some epic play in the game. Just picking, playing it and winning on it is actually ballsy as fuck, isn't it? Winning the world championship Respect. with everything on the line is, is really yeah. huge. Now, if we're talking about in-game play. It's also so perfect for his career as well, because oh. the thing that's made him so unique is all these crazy picks over the years, isn't it? Yeah, and it's not that Barrel is like a top tier mechanical support player. It's more, uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard some of the in game shot calling that he was doing uh, throughout this series and throughout Worlds that was very impressive, as well as, as you, as you say, Thor, and his toolbox of different champions that he can bring out. And I think like the problem with Barrel is it's a lot of intangibles for him as a player rather than what you necessarily you're looking at. But he did warp the fabric of this game and he did warp the fabric yes. of this series pretty seriously. Now, if you're looking for an in-game play, I think that Kingen's games on Aatrox, he did have a variety of super good flanks and team fighting moves that were arguably the most important moments in-game that DRX was able to pull off the wins in games four and five. Uh, so you could go with the king and angle here. However, I personally just am feeling barrel because of because yeah, of the sure. pick. I mean, that's like that that to me is is truly I think lives up to the the big dick energy yes. that we want from this award. So I was wondering how we were going to find the angle for that because like narratively you could do it a million ways, but in terms of actual like I said a, a, a signature play that was actually the one downside of the finals, Monty. Is it was a brilliant yeah. series. It was mega exciting, oh, but actually yeah. there wasn't really like like for example, there's no player on DRX really like carried the whole series. Like King and played great because he was supposed to be the weakest player, but like no, I agree there wasn't really like that's why it was actually to me such a miracle win for the RX. Like they even just did it as a squad. It was, it was crazy. I thought, I still can't believe it now, Monty. That's it. All those pictures you saw from like, they didn't really win, did they? Surely. Surely no, no. this was all it bad was so dream. Funny. Oh. Cause Wolf was, uh, Wolf was in San Francisco for us at the live event. And after over, he was like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and, and think that T1 won worlds. Like it's yes. just so unbelievable that this could possibly happen. I'm still kind of reeling as a result of it. Even while we were there, I was really hoping it was going to happen because obviously the storyline is just so fucking cool. good. Uh, I was really hoping, like, by the time we got to, like, Game 4 and 5, I was like, come on, DRX, come on, just fucking do it. But I never really believed. And I, I still, like I said, kind of don't believe it now. Yes. I've got one question, by the way. Obviously, technically, we're doing the giveaway, the award thing, but it's someone insights. So we can have a little detour. <laughs> one side question I did have, since we obviously never did do an episode after the World's Finals. One thing I did want to ask you, because I only stayed for the first part of that, and obviously, I was just watching the games. It was super late at night. People don't know it began at like 1 a.m. European time. It's right. the beginning yeah, of yeah. season. So the question I did want to ask you was this, actually. The one thing I was a bit underwhelmed by in this final is this. Since people did bill it, like, like let's be real, because everyone thought T1 was going to win, 
everyone was already ready with all their narratives about Faker's career and like giving him like, extra plaudits, etc. I actually thought he played like a little bit underwhelming in the final ones. Oh yeah. Like you know what I mean? Like what? Like this was exactly where all we needed was one like signature fit, take over the game, Faker game, and did you win the title, mate? Like I kept waiting for it. I kept thinking it's going to happen eventually. So sort of, it's just a bit underwhelmed me a bit. What did you think? I think he played probably worse in this series than he did in the other two playoff series that he played. Obviously, the semifinal from him was incredibly smurfing, impressive. Yeah. Um, so it's hard for me to say that Faker was really, uh, you know, the issue of T1. I do think in this final, he struggled. But it's also, by the time the last few games rolled around, first off, it was very difficult, I think, for him to play victor into the bard and into the caitlin that we and the azir that we saw as well oh my god as well as the hecarim i mean drx really just like went crazy in that last draft and picked a lot of champions that um were going to be able to shut him down um also i think that in game four as well drx did have a very tricky draft where they managed to get the maokai back into the jungle because remember the the Silas had typically been the answer to that. So we saw DRX in play-ins. They were really, they were the ones who kind of brought out the Maokai jungle in play-ins at first. And then Maokai became this really big pick. And then we started to see teams like selecting Silas into it. So he would steal the Maokai ult and basically become the better yes. version of Maokai, which then decreased Maokai priority. But the thing about this series is that DRX managed to sneak in that Maokai pick after um, the, the, you know, the Akali had already been locked in. And so, but in showing that Akali early, the Maokai really has a lot of advantages because you can just ult right through the Akali and zone her out or get her in the smoke. Like, so there's a lot of advantages that you can have. And so by sneaking that pick back in, you got to see the power of the Maokai that we saw earlier in the tournament without necessarily the answer from T1. So I think he was put, especially in games four and five, into disadvantageous situations. But it also doesn't ex excuse some like pretty bad play that I think he had in this series. Which was disappointing because we saw kind of a vintage Baker, Faker performance in the semifinal uh, against JDG, where he was arguably the best player on his team in that series. So I do think that gives him some forgiveness uh, for the finals overall. But it really felt like T1 kind of collectively failed. They got outdrafted, especially the longer the series went on, and you just didn't see the the depth of performance that you saw on DRX. So yeah, I think it, I think he wasn't he wasn't great but also that the context of his worlds is still very positive. Right, okay. So as I, as I alluded to, we're going to give some away to people who made bets, right? We didn't have tons and tons, but we had some that were pretty good because the key thing about yeah, this yeah. was, just like we just did with the players there, guys, where we don't just give it to someone who just did anything. Like, we try to pick someone where the angle is. It's pretty ballsy that you went for this player. Like, it's pretty cool that you pulled it off. Similarly, right, we've got a couple of good ones here. Like, one that you were showing me, Monty, that I think is epic because I, I only realized it actually only, the, only dawned on me how epic it was when I looked at the odds. So I was looking and I saw that this guy had, like, T1 winning game two of the RNG series in the quarters, right? Not a big deal there. It was a big deal. The real question is, how did he get 6.149 odds? Because obviously T1 oh, was favoured if people don't know, right? Yeah. That means, guys, he bet when the game was live and when that Jace in the top lane was already feeding. And remember, <laughs> by the way, that alone is gangsters, fuck. So a world championship, <laughs> you're betting on a Jace that is dying in lane, like... <laughs> Listen, if you pull that off, so the amount that he won, right? He bet 37.5 DJT. This is Azure Catalyst. And he won 193 DJT. So 193,000. Oh, 1,000, yes. yes. Yeah. So that's pretty epic, um, yeah. Yeah. That, I, look, call. I, think, I think it was a really good call on a game that, you know, you. this is how you find those, those really good odds. Like T1 still felt like they were in that game because Gubayushi and Karia were doing uh, so well in the bot lane on the Zaya and the uh, the Renata Glask. So in this game, what had effectively happened is that each team had prioritized a different side of the map and they had basically, the other team had like sacrificed that side. So when Zaya started to fall behind, we saw a lot of the pressure from owner come into the bot lane. Gubayushi and Karia were doing very well. So... They did have still pretty big advantages, and even though Zayas was behind, people were still saying, wow, he's he's still, even as an 0-8 Jace, very effective within this game by 0-8 Jace standards. And so T1 ended up dragging out this game to 42 minutes. They end up in this Elder Dragon fight and, and luckily win that game. But I think they weren't probably as far behind as those odds would signify, but getting yes. the, the value in the live odds. It's the same thing that... Um, 
that happened in the uh, RNG detonation focus me when I was streaming it. And I managed to get uh, the the huge detonation focus me odds when they were pretty far ahead, kind of like the reverse of that scenario where they were a huge underdog who was slightly ahead. So I thought they might be able to close it out. This time you have a favorite who appears to be behind, but still has really tangible advantages. And so you just have to have some good game knowledge and look at that scenario and say, there's still a path to victory here for T1. They're not 6.1 odds behind. You can get a lot of value if you're if you're watching along live. So yes. I agree that one was uh, that one was good. You know what's funny, Thorne, is that guy actually he bet on the that same game at two different points. So he got the six point one odds, but he also got three point three odds. I guess when they were perhaps not that far behind. So in total, uh, you know, he put seventy five k at three point three odds, got one hundred seventy six k back. 37.5 at six odds, 193K back. So really like doubled down and did extremely well. Did extremely well there. I actually so think, shout by out the way. As your catalyst, you'll get one. We'll send you one of these big, yeah, big energy yeah. trucks. One thing I've been looking at, because obviously the unique thing when you do the betting on esports bet is each esports game has a different setup format, when you can bet, when you can't. Like in the same way as I told you, in CSGO, I feel like my edge there is like sometimes I think you can get a good point of like when you call the two zero, because you know what the maps are going to be. That's the unique thing about the way the draft element works in Counter-Strike. I actually think in League of Legends, Monty, the real game changer we didn't know about in the beginning is betting after the draft and these scenarios yeah. you're talking about. Like basically in that scenario, you're also betting against the ignorance of just random people who don't know that much about the game because what they're doing in that scenario if you think about it is the reason the odds are going crazy is they're seeing like a team takes a couple of dragons or something or it's like a kill in a lane and then they're just betting on the favourite like oh give me the guaranteed money so yep. the, what's ridiculous is like you're saying especially on some of the scaling ones you could get some crazy odds for like games that are just like a coin flip if you actually know the game at that point yeah. in the game state it's wild yeah I would say that's yeah. the pro tip if you're out there if you want like a fun angle for a game that's live that's the other thing to do if you don't know before the game just wait till either after the the draft or yeah again if you think the scaling comp is going to win it's going to activate at some point you're going to get mad odds because every fan's going to think it's over yeah it's like um you know it's like some of those games perhaps that eg played in the group stage which is that they were playing in theory you know a very good composition that had a lot of early dragon control but they probably weren't going to be able to actually execute that at the level to close the game quick enough against most of their opponents and that's where you can kind of even if they're ahead, get some good odds on, on a potential favorite because uh, that favorite is likely to make that kind of comeback, right? Same thing as we saw in, in T1 versus RNG. So listen, listen to people who know the game or just know the game yourself and look at those states and then, as Thorne's saying, go for the live odds. You got uh, another, another one good that analyzed one. you? No, do yeah, you have no, another one? Yeah, the other one that I really liked was this one by... Uh, Dido45 is technically the alias he's put, so I'll just use that, which is he actually bet, and he actually bet crypto, by the way, he bet USDT. He bet 105 USDT on DRX in game five of the final. Like, that's just gangster, mate. Like, like I, again... <laughs> Like fair player, just fair player. Like if you if you could pick all those rookies and people like King and Pjorsic to win that game five, like that's that's amazing. Mate. I wouldn't have done that no matter. What. I would, by the way, like I said before, I'm, I'm in denial now, mate. That it even happened. Like I, I still can't believe they won game five again. It's game five. You could easily just chalk that away and be the underdogs. Couldn't well, of course, especially because uh, the odds were only one point nine five eight for DRX in that game five, which like means that there were. Probably what one point six odds approximately, yeah, uh, for T one. So most yep. people would just take T one in exactly. that situation. And those are great, great odds for a favorite. Yeah, yeah. one point six. <laughs> or I agree. So double doubled his money off of that one. I think that's a that's another that's another good one. And he also he bet also, DJ T himself as well. Notice, yep. yeah, he's doubled up on that one. But no, that that's just he, legit as fuck, mate. Yeah, yeah, he he doubled up uh, on the DJ T on the game five win. Had three hundred fifteen thousand. 315,000 DJT bet at uh, 2.178 odds. So, yeah, I think I think Dido 45 probably. We'll, we'll ship you one of these yeah, two. We'll get your, your information and ship it over. All right, what about the last one? Didn't we have one more we needed? Yeah, yeah, look. I I have I have a uh, I have another one here which is um just the the T1 versus DRX best of five series win. So this would would have had to be placed before the match started. Um just a straight up 3.503. That is a heavy underdog, especially for a Massive. grand final yes. of the biggest tournament of the year. Uh, 240 USDT from Cows Rule All 
one eight hundred and forty three USDT, just straight up on the three point five odds. You know, I Thorin, I, I'm kicking myself because if I had placed before the semifinals like a flyer for DRX to win Worlds, the odds were like fifteen to one. I forget exactly what they were. They're like twelve. She did to do one it, but I only did one. like a hundred USDT on Fortune, <laughs> no! so I didn't get much exactly. I got like four. I got like a thousand something. But then I realized, wait a minute, because I think I just did it like as, as a laugh, like exactly. I'll say it was fourteen to one before semis. So that's why, by right. the way, that's what I like about doing the betting now. By the way, about it takes so many of those BS narratives and just corrects them. Like, you know what I wish? I wish we could go back in time and know Monty. So, you know, when people used to gaslight me and you, like, actually, uh, a lot of us thought TPA would win season two worlds. I wish I could go and see those fucking odds now and go, like, well, if you'd have bet before, you know, round of eight, you'd have won, like, you would have been like 20 to one or something. Like, no, it's the same thing. I agree. Because what that tells you, fans, is this. Think about this. When is someone in the semi final of worlds going to be a 14 to one fit, like, underdog? <laughs> That's Never. crazy. That's so what, that, what that implies exactly is both the betting and everyone placing markets were telling you this is not going to happen. So I agree. If before the entire final, he not only picked DRX to win it, but he bet actual crypto as well. This guy, that, That's fair enough. Look, he's either the biggest death fan ever or that is just a <laughs> hell of a call. I, but I, mean, I said it before the final. I thought they were going to freeze even with me. I thought there's no way yep. they're winning. Come on. I, I think fair everybody way. was saying anything other than a three zero for T one is going to be a, a good game by yes. And so the fact that it went full five games was the best world finals ever, maybe not in terms of actual game quality, but certainly in terms of excitement and interest, oh, for sure. and like yeah. un undeniably, I think this has been the, the best world championship in league of legends history. The meta was awesome. The storyline was, I, I don't even know how you could have asked for a better storyline that it would be hard to invent a better story, line, story yes. out of the teams that were attending yes. than what we actually got. Um, and then, you know, the, the gameplay was really exciting. We had a lot of really good best of fives. It's one of those rare times where this format actually produced a good result. And it's not to say that this format shouldn't be changed. We just got lucky this time. Look at all the other times we didn't get lucky because the format was garbage. <laughs> By the way, I, I, what I like as well is I didn't do this in any way, like some 500 IQ plan in advance. Like I knew, but you know how, when I did my little hype trailer for Deft before the semifinal, yes. right? First of all, fans <laughs> understand that was very cynical. I did it before the semis because there was no way he was winning the semis, right? <laughs> and then secondly, <laughs> of course I did. And then secondly, even though I put it like in that open-ended way at the end, like, what will you show me next, Deft? Like, spoiler, my own answer would have been like, nothing. This is probably it. Like, have a great career and everything. Like, so even though now it looks like I set it up, so now it looks even better. Like, I didn't know any of that, guys. Of course not. I thought that for real, he was definitely losing that semi-final. Come on, it was Gen G for fuck's sake. <laughs> Well, um, I think we should transition. So uh, thanks again to Azure Catalyst, Dado45, and Cows Rule All. Uh, we'll be getting your contact information, and I will ship you some of these really awesome trophies. So congrats on your Big Dick Energy trophies. I will also be- We'll probably uh, do it again for Worlds next year or something similar, right? We'll yeah. have a similar concept. We'll do something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really fun. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this. We are going to switch gears into some of the roster rumors. Now, for you guys who are interested in LEC rosters, we did a rundown um, of every single team on Power Spike with me, Degon, and I Will Dominate because that was kind of the first region to settle. So um, we'll get Thorin's thoughts on some of those in a second. But mostly, I think we'll be talking about like the LCK and, and LCS stuff that's come out. LPL seems like it's still kind of in flux. Also, as far as Korean players go, Wolf and I will probably do a show later this week on the Monty and Wolf show just talking about Korean roster movements. So either Korean players who are going to different regions or Korean players who are returning like Viper or the new LCK rosters. So we'll do something a little bit more in depth, but figured we should do some of the high level stuff, especially because as of today, this recording, Faker has... <gasps> shockingly re-signed for three more years with T1. I know you guys were like, oh, he's coming to Team Liquid. He's leaving this time. He was never going to give up his equity, guys, in T1. He was never... He's so much more valuable to T1 than he is to any other team on the planet because all of their sponsors are there because of Faker. Like, him leaving would, like, blow up their sponsors. Also, they're literally owned by... SK Telecom, a massive multi-billion dollar company, and Comcast. There is no one who can pay Faker more than these guys. So the reality of him leaving, he does this because he's trying to get his salary up. He's trying to like actually make sure that he gets the best possible deal out of T1. So he's going to have some conversations to test his value in the market. But I don't think he was ever seriously considering leaving. Here's what's wild, right? 
I actually, I, the entire time, Monty, I had the same read you're talking about here. Like, I never really thought for one second he was ever leaving T1. <laughs> and by the way, if he ever did leave T1, the only player that makes any sense logically is go to the LPL for the maximum amount of money. Everyone who thinks he's going to LCS to Team Liquid, I don't, because here's the problem. If you go to LCS, you just give up all the competitive element. It's only money you no. can have at that point in time. So the reason why I don't believe that, Monty, is because the specific TL angle, which was the rumour, that just, that just, like, if you don't know much about sports or esports, that just screams that's Faker's agent telling the press, you know, we're thinking about Team Liquid because he wants that rumor to get out there and circulate and all the fans yeah. get hyped. And because what you want to do, as you're saying, is go back to T1 with like the blank check from Team Liquid, like, uh, we're going to need to renegotiate our position for the next... And it's just what you were going to do all along. I'll give people a quick aside. Because basically, I've found this is actually a trick they do in American sports, Monty. This happens a lot in the NFL. What they do is, it's even happened with players like Aaron Rodgers, right? When there's the period when they're going to renegotiate, the same thing happens, Monty. These new stories come out in different places. Like, oh, you know, he's looking at property in like Arizona or something. So then all the Cardinals fans are like, oh, you mean we could get Aaron Rodgers? He's coming! He's coming, guys! But then they never do... <laughs> And then magically it'll be like, yeah, Roger signs even bigger deal with Green Bay. Like, what? If you're the Arizona fan, you're like, what the hell? It's like, I'm sorry, you're the wrestling mark. Like, they tricked you with that narrative, guys. They got you. Like, because I, I, I had the same feeling, Monty. Like, I didn't ever really believe he was leaving. Come on. So, so <laughs> the thing is, is that I, the only reason that he would come to North America is if he wanted to get a green card to avoid his military service, right? Ah, there is right. A, okay. There is a possible justification there, but. I I think like whatever is going on with Deft, where Deft magically like was gonna have to do his military service and didn't have to do his military service. I think there's some shenanigans going on right now with some of these Korean players, and maybe some of them are going to get exempted. Or Faker thinks that he's gonna get selected for the Asian Games, which got pushed back, win a gold medal with Korea, then get exempted that way. Maybe he wants to try to get exempted that way. Uh, maybe he just wants to go to the military because there's a pretty big social stigma in Korea if you dodge military service right. that kind of hounds you for the rest of your life. Um, it's it's not seen as particularly honorable. Let's put it that way. Um, so perhaps like he's just going to do it because he has infinity money and can afford to take. I mean, the military service is only like, I think, 19 months now. It's been lowered from two years. It can um, also be way lower as well, like depending on yeah. what the assignment you get or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of variables. Uh, we're not going to go into that here. But basically, with Faker giving up all of his equity to go to team liquid to spend multiple years in America. Cause it takes like three or four years oftentimes to get the, the green card that you need, unless he was really seriously considering a long-term move to North America, which he just doesn't have to do. He's going to be more comfortable staying in Korea. That's the reason he's always stayed there. Even when he could have gotten the big money from LPL in like 2015, right? He, he was the only one who stayed after the, the Korean exodus that happened at the end of 2014. And uh, he didn't. So I don't see a reason why he would move right now. He still courted this team. Even if he is beyond his playing days, I think they would just move him into a coaching position because he's still so valuable, both you know in terms of his game knowledge, but also just in terms of being the figurehead of T1. Like T1 losing him collapses the T1 brand. They don't have anything else right now. Um, they, they're going to build a Valorant team in Asia, in Korea, I guess, but it's not like they've got a lot of other options uh, when it comes to their brand. So I think he was just too important. He was signed at all costs. They could afford to pay him whatever. Um, and the equity we'll angle see. you're bringing up is also a big one because I know his fans missed that as well. They're yeah. just thinking pure dollar amount of the salary, but like it, the equity, if you think about this, that could be worth an enormous amount one day. Bearing in mind, this org yeah. is going to be positioned, especially within Asia, to always have like a foot in the door of every big league. Everyone would want them. So, like, that's one where I think, Monty, like, like giving that up alone might just not be worth it, no matter what the amount of raw dollar amount is. Like, who knows what that could be worth in 10 years? Right. You also have to think about the long term effects of Faker's career. Whenever he retires from being a player, he's still going to be an ambassador for the team. And his mere fame and presence is going to draw more people, more players to want to play for T1. He's part of the prestige of the brand. And when he also owns part of that brand, then his his magnetism, as it were, drawing future good players keeps the team uh, more valuable. So as, as a long term play unless, and like Team Liquid, the way it works is like, you know, they can't, I believe they can't give players equity until they've played for that team for what, three years or something like that? Because that of that LCS, LCS thing, rule. if people remember the thing with Cloud9 and all the TSM yeah. and that. Yes, exactly. 
Yeah. So Something you like would that. have to spend a lot of time there, and it's just not, it's just not worth it. Uh, By I the way, as an aside as well, let's be real. From the competitive angle, nothing to complain about with T1. Minus maybe like season seven and season eight, where there were some questionable pickups. Dude, they've done a really good job putting talent around fake in the last three or four yes. years. Like, there's a reason he's racked up all those LCK titles with different teammates. Like, he's not only had like top draw players, he's had some of the greatest players ever signed in their prime. Even this last one, dude, there's all these rookies they put around him turned out to be awesome. Like, they They've done it. Yeah. If, you, if you just want to play a few more years, as you've seen now, you still have an outside crack at Worlds even all these years. It makes, to me, I know, I know it would have been like a, a LeBron decision type momentous moment if he'd left it. It would be cool in that regard as a novel moment. But I actually think it's just right he stays with T1, mate. Like it's actually just the best place to be. You also have to think of this from a legacy perspective. What would have happened if Faker leaves T1 and then ends ends with middling North American or Chinese play. Like he is so well set up to continue to succeed in Korea because of the development system and because the the team is willing to spend a lot of money to put talent around him and to retain that talent. Um, I think Joe Marsh tweeted that they're spending more on T1 this next year than they ever have before. In fact, they they recently just announced that they had signed Tom, Sky, and Roach. Um, Roach was already part of the team. And Sky was already part of the team, but they brought Tom over as well, the former uh, T1 player, and they still have Bengi. So they're doing a lot to uh, retain their coaching staff and add additional yeah. resources surrounding Faker. And I think... Of his really joke are... being, when Bengi was there in the office, that Tom guy walked in, he was like, what the fuck is this guy doing here? You, you promised me I'd never see him again. He was like, people don't know, he briefly replaced he Bengi. In the last... He was bad. He was, bad, he was also he bad. Was pretty bad. He was also bad. True. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, anyway, uh, T1, T1 roster looking like it's, it's pretty much going to be, um, firmed up there. So a list uh, of where all these rosters are, by the way, like for the latest version, do you have something? Do you want LC? Uh, yeah. Here yeah. I just so I can see what we're talking about. Boom. In case I have a slightly different one. Um, yeah. So effectively T1 is going to be going to be running it back, uh, as you guys know, with their roster. The only player who actually was a free agent at the end of this year was Faker. The rest of the team's Zayas owner, Kamiyoshi in Korea, are not going to be uh, free agents until the end of next year. So we'll see what kind of infrastructure they put around them. Obviously, that infrastructure was a big problem for a lot of the early parts of this year before they made some changes, and it seems like they're doubling down on, on those elements for success. Uh, are there any other... I guess we can talk about some of the Korean roster moves first. Um, there's not been everything that's been locked down. So some of the teams don't have rosters right now, but probably some of the biggest moves are like Deft to Damwon, which is obviously huge. It's enormous. Yeah. And Kana as well, because Nogari just announced his retirement. Um, Viper is coming back um, to, to Hanwha life. So he's returning to Korea, arguably the best AD carry in the world, you know, kind of 1A, 1B, potentially with Ruler, who appears to be going to JDG right now. Um, and then Zeka and what Kingen. A, dude, what an interesting lineup that Hanwha Life one is, though. Yeah. Because what's funny is now after Worlds, all of a sudden, like, the King and Angle doesn't even seem that bad. He played great. Like, you've got King and <laughs> Clid's back, the old T1 jungler. Zeka's in that team. Viper and then Life. Everyone knows Life as well. Like, these are all, like, well-established players. That's an interesting team, mate. That, like, that's probably, like, a dark horse team. I mean, look, I think that that team is going to be pretty good. The question about Zeka is really, as, as Papa Smithy was talking about it, whether he's a patch Zerg or not, because this yes. was kind of, this Worlds was really like a perfect storm for him. And yes, he played a lot better than we had ever seen him play before. And I think he was the MVP of the entire world of, Worlds event. But we do need to see more from him. And I guess what I like about this team, Thorin, is at least if King and and Zeka kind of regressed to the mean, Viper is still there to be fucking incredible, right? So it, it feels like this team is pretty well balanced. Clid is going to be coming back uh, from LPL from his time on... Still looks uh, like a better version of the unit. RX. Yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I, I think it's cool. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I think the, the thing that you have to question is whether or not... Um, whether or not this edition of the roster is going to be hurt by the lack of barrel shot calling, which seemed to be yes. an enormous part of DRX's success at the world championship. Um, unclear as to, as to whether they're going to have the same level of, of 
um, kind of draft diversity and uh, macro play that saw them be so successful. Uh, so that would be my my reluctance here. Um, Deft also going to Damwon Key alongside Kana is exciting. Kana, That's a pretty banging yeah. lineup, yeah. Yeah, Kana look had a very good 2021 before he got replaced by Zayas. Remember, he played most of the year. Uh, Zayas played some games early in the spring of 2021 and then was benched. Kana then comes back and uh, on Nongshim. Nongshim, I think, was a failure. <laughs> so, they were somehow less than the sum of their parts, oh, right? Terrible. Yeah. They were terrible. Every name on the, the team was a known player. Everyone, everyone was like semi legit. Exactly. I think they had real internal personality <laughs> yes, or, or synergy issues that they must have. So I think Kana is is good here. Kana's also a very stable player for the most part, as is Deft. So I think this roster looks really strong. Um, as much as Dokdam was was like pretty good, he still was not the most complete player in the bot lane. And again, I think this gives them a lot better champion diversity with Deft, as well as, you know, obviously Deft's incredible team fighting. Also kind of an egoless roster as well, yes, which is interesting. Agreed. I feel like um, they could they could adapt to the metas very well, whether it's yes. top or bot focused. I mean, what's what's crazy is like you kind of know what you're gonna get with Kana. Kana is pretty well rounded, but he he can play more of a weak side role. Yes. I think, especially in this roster. But you're getting such insane champion pool depth between Canyon Showmaker and Depth, the Deft that I, I think this roster could be I, really, really. I can't handle well. that it says Deft's only 26 years old. How, how is that possible exactly? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what the um, fuck? Dude, we started this show eight years ago. What the hell? <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous isn't it yeah. i feel like he should be like 35 or something with that i know right we're just the, we're just the boomers <laughs> um because that's the thing about it, that lineup dude you look at it like because same thing you feel like you've seen canyon and showbaker forever mate they're all like right in the the prime of their youth like the average age of the team is like 23 or something 22 or something. <laughs> that's, that, that team could be really good yeah um also they brought in gorilla which is exciting uh always a player that i have really enjoyed so they they bring in gorilla and they uh they bring in acorn so uh two veteran players who are older than any of the current players on the roster and they will be probably doing some pretty interesting things i'm a bit sad about denny because i think Danny actually was quite good at drafting it's just that his team couldn't execute on it because they lacked kind of the shot calling oomph to to get things done um but Perhaps Bible will be on this roster eventually. It was fun seeing him play as a substitute in some of those games instead of Kellen, and hopefully we'll see a more fluid system. Um, obviously, Gen G, no more ruler. They're bringing up Pays. They brought in Delight uh, from Fred at Breon. Uh, we'll have to see What's how. What's the story I don't... on this, by the way? Because this one is mad under one. Obviously, they've gone from a super team to like, like, are these actually touted as like the next top talents in bot lane? I've heard Pace is pretty good. Um, Delight is interesting. It's hard to tell he was on such a bad team this past year. Pays, I have had there have been some people singing singing his praises. Um, obviously, replacing Ruler is going to be extremely difficult. But with the coaching staff, I think Genji's coaching staff is very good. Score and Mafa are are staying on. Uh, hopefully, they'll be able to kind of get him into a point where uh, he can start to succeed but obviously this is you know a downgrade you, there's no other there's no other way to say it <laughs> there's no other way to say it it's a downgrade it's unfortunate but i i think uh i think perhaps gen g may not have wanted to all in quite as hard and, and try and re-sign ruler the other lineup that i listen i know it's just plays into the classic fucking stereotypes of this show but it's accurate. You know what, Monty? I am excited for KT Rolls. No, I think the slide is pretty good. What are you talking about? It's legit. They got Rapid Star back. Rapid Star is a coach now. So here's the thing about Keen. Keen really played like shit last year. He might have been sure. the worst top laner in the LCK. Is Keen bad because he's bad, or was Keen just unmotivated last year? Difficult to know. He still right. has the fundamentals of being a good player. Um, it is kind of sad. <laughs> I say this. Uh, even though my friend Papa Smithy brought Vikla over to FlyQuest. Um, it is kind of sad to lose Vikla because he was a very young player and a very exciting For up and coming sure. player. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I've never been a huge fan of BDD because I find him boring for the most part. 
Uh, but he is very. Is that amazing longevity though? Isn't he? Yeah, yeah his flaw yeah, of his so. play has been very good for a long time. Yeah. At, at least they kept aiming, and they did pick up Lehens. Uh, I think the bot lane looks fire, mate. Yeah, the the bot lane is probably pretty good. If people don't I mean, know aiming was very good this year. I thought. Yeah, yeah, he was really good, especially in the like the kind of Zeri Siver meta, uh, especially on on the Zeri. Whether he's going to be able to continue that level of play on a, a bigger variety of AD carries will be the question. But he is certainly one of the ADC stars of the LCK. I'm tentatively excited for this roster. It certainly is a better on paper roster than they were able to put out last year. And considering they they almost made worlds, I think that's that's saying something. So potentially a contender. Potentially a contender. Oh, and then the one to... other piece of news, just in case people aren't aware, is one of my all-time favorites. CV Max is back. He's the coach of freaks <laughs> now. Because if people don't know, mate, I'll probably do like a video. Maybe I'll even do something for our company. Maybe like do like a little mini documentary piece or something. Mate, people need to do some content about how many people this guy discovered. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Like, <laughs> right. it's not only just the, the Griffin, Griffin players, like Canavi, yeah. like, oh, it's ridiculous, mate. The BDRX players, like, this guy I just has, like, he has the Midas touch in Korea. He's what an amazing eye for, like, up and coming players yeah and i think it's exciting too because they're you know he'll probably put his touch on this well, roster yeah exactly and and, and and bring up some new talent and there does seem to be a lot of really viable talent in the pipeline like you were saying earlier look at t what t1 has done this year um even even players that were like already existed but developed a lot more like prince this year uh under under um live sandbox so Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff for sure. Um, we've already, we like I said, we already touched on a lot of the European rosters on Power Strike with me and and Dom and Digon. Well, Were Spike, there any well, like yeah. what, <laughs> what you said, Power Stripe or something? Well, yeah, Power whatever. Strike, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, were there any like roster moves that that intrigued you over on the European side? Because on LEC, you were, there was a few I yeah. thought were quite interesting. Like the, the Odo Amne, Zerxe, Vito. I Tarkana, think that's Spitzel mental. Is fucking people, crazy. What I can't understand about this is like I already made a video about this in the off season. Like the cool thing I think about the XL project is obviously I was initially interested because they got Youngbok who has six championships in the LEC, and I knew this was a guy who was a great coach. But the problem is, my take on it is he seems like he's a coach who's really good working with the big names though. So when you gave him the lesser names, it was all right. And he always did like a pretty decent job, but there weren't the pieces of that team to ever win LEC. How he has ended up with this line. Like, dude, I'll just say right now, XL won this off season so hard. It's ridiculous. But, but I'll tell you what, what, here's the problem. Part of it was the throw. They caught some throws, Monty. Like, exactly. how are you getting on to one there for free after you just won the title? Dude, what? They got you know what I mean? They got VTO Targamas and Odo Amne for free. How the fuck do you do that? Oh, I think That's those so are wild. Because think me. about this. To me... Vethio, after Caps, is the second best player you would pick at mid lane to, to have a team going forwards. So they're getting him upgrade over Nuke Dog. And then, as you say, the Targ Armas one, I think, is absolutely crazy. Like, <laughs> look, Mick X and Targ Armas are both good players. But why G2 would bring Targ Armas in, give him a year, fully blood him, send him to the international court, and then let someone else have him? I don't get that. Because I really think that's a player, mate, where that I think that move might look terrible in two or three years. Like, that's a player who looks like he can be in the vein of the all-time great supports from Europe. And you're giving away after one year. I, I think that's just crazy. So I, how XL's caught all these throws? Like Nelson and Yonbok have fucking killed him, man. And Rich as well. <laughs> if people don't know Rich is actually working in like the back, the front office there or something now was like some like position in XL. Oh, they've done a great job, mate. Yeah. They've done a great job. I've heard no. if it was, I'll give you a little gem. I've even heard if it wasn't for like the cost, they might even have gone for the Yankos move and just made like a super team in the off season. Like, <laughs> I think it's crazy, mate. Because some, I, I think for real, on paper, I think that is the best roster. I genuinely do. I mean, where's the weak spot? It's mega. <laughs> it certainly seems, it certainly seems very strong. I'm, I'm excited to watch it. I think Patrick has to step up a little bit more uh, if they really want to contend. And here's the thing. I now is when we find out, you know, people have been telling us, Monty, for year, like half a decade now, this guy's the truth. He has the team now, doesn't he? So it's like, I yep. told my old mate for giving back and there's no excuses <laughs> left now, mate. You have to actually win. You better just win the yeah, championship I now. <laughs> I think the other question is with a lot of the jungle changes they're coming through, whether That's a true. farming jungler like Xerxes yes. is going to do super well. Um, so those would be my two question marks, but, on paper, Ooh, obviously. Amazing pieces, though, great. yeah. Some <laughs> uh, care, care to share your thoughts on the recently officially announced a Reckless in, in favor of Upset on Fnatic, which is another just mind-bending decision? 
Yeah, the one that I don't get about this is this, right? I actually, look, if it wasn't upset leaving, I have no problem with this move. I actually think it's crazy that Reckless was even in the RLs. I know look, there's some beef between sure, him and G2, yeah. which probably scuffed his negotiations a year ago. But for anyone basically except for Fnatic, I don't think it's the end of the world if you sign Reckless. It might even be the right move. Like It's probably actually a pretty good bounce back year, I would assume. But the weird part is, yeah, one, they replaced Upset, who if you just watched this year, was like far and away their best player. Like It's not even, it's not even a debate. Like He's the only one that never went to shit and actually was even hard carrying him by the playoffs and by Worlds. But then not only do you remove him, but then you've let Hillisan go. That angle's out the window. You're bringing in the Rocks guy who was like the the young player who played in the fucking, instead of Hillisang, briefly in playing. So like, Plains, yeah. that already is like, if that's not a slam dunk, that works. That's the part I find crazy. And then the second part is, I don't know if other people take this angle, but I actually took this to be, you know, one of the things that Yamato talked about and in general was like a problem in the team was you had Upset, who, because of how his career's gone, the way Upset knows how to play is through bot lane and through Upset, obviously. But you had Wonder at the same time who maybe could have carried more, but you couldn't because you had to play around upset, right? The angle I have on this is, since they've kept Wonder, which I think was a good player, I almost get the vibe here. The premise is like, we're going old school reckless weak side and we're going to play through the solos. You yep. don't take that angle? That's what I thought. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I just think it's interesting because if you're trying to play through those lanes, now Humanoid had a very good Worlds performance, but even at Worlds, you saw the, the clear lack of synergy between Razork and Humanoid rear its ugly head again. It looked like it, in LEC playoffs, it might have been like on the way to being fixed, but then it kind of regressed again at Worlds. So I would have thought, now obviously like we know everybody wanted El Yoya and like El Yoya, they were probably trying to trade El Yoya. I think they were trying to trade El Yoya for Razork on this roster. Um, but it, but it didn't end up working out. So what you have is like this same kind of anti-synergy that didn't get fixed in an entire year. So why would I believe that this is going to be fixed now? You know what I mean? Like that's to me, this that's is the a most weird, weird. Yeah. Here's what I don't get. I thought it was one or the other of those two, 100%, the jungle and mid. It's like, pick which one. Because by the way, after Worlds, you could have made arguments for both sides. Like I thought Humanoid did have some egregious sure. incidents. And actually Razork by the end was one of the few conditions that you knew if you put one on the right pick, he could do something. But well, also, yeah, I did the keep them both. Razork is crazy. was incredible in the LEC playoffs. He was the, he was the reason why they did so well, right? Uh, before Humanoid really came back online again at Worlds. So they've kind of alternated being important, but they've never actually like gotten it together like basically my problem with this lineup is i just don't know if i like i actually think the players are good but i don't know if the team like approach is going to be i don't know if the synergy is going to be there that's my main concern and yeah the idea that you haven't addressed the razor humanoid thing you're just sort of hoping they all wake up next year and there's no issue that's wild to me but whatever <laughs> <laughs> i also don't really think it was a coaching issue that there's something that's in the way these guys see the game that just isn't lining up and I, I don't know if that's if that's going to be something that's that's solved um any any other final comments on on some of these uh some of these things Couple these, more. yeah you what, what you got what you got right vitality the, is obviously very interesting <laughs> uh let's have a look yeah the vitality one's not bad like obviously the key thing with that is Alfari announced he was like taking time off or whatever. So they go with like the different angle on that. The key thing for me with this move is I actually think they've picked some really fucking good pickups on the Vitality one. Like I've always been a big Kaiser fan. I thought he was very oh, good. Yeah. Then you Great. look like Neon, like how could someone not sign him after this last year? He's just been smurfing the whole time. He's just awesome. He's genuinely been one of the best at his role. So you add them into the mix. Like, look, I assume the top lane is just going to be a fucking weak side player anyway. So like after how Perks play, if people don't know Perks had a really good year. I thought his summer was awesome. Like I actually think this team's like a legit dark horse to win the whole thing. I think they've done a good job reopening talent. It's a shame they couldn't have Alfari for this split, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see Bo, obviously, after all of the hype that's been generated around this guy, both in China and then as well as in solo queue since he was in Europe. Hopefully we're we're going to see some starting performances from him. And um, yeah, I think it should be should be a fun roster. The one that I just can't handle, though, I've got to say, is the G2 one. Man, I actually think this G2 roster is going to be mad underwhelming. I think it's going to be worse than this last lineup they just had. Where if people don't know, because they, they had that whole thing where they were trying to get El Yai, they, they brought in the guy, also, in an era of memes, you can actually bring a player called Yike. One Yike. <laughs> you put, the jokes write themselves, mate. Like, I haven't even started yet. Like, that's mental in itself. Again, I'll, I'll point this out. Just like Nuclear In, 
If you are going to call yourself Yike, you better actually just like be ironically Yike, like the greatest player to ever play League of Legends. Spoiler, I wouldn't call myself Yike if I was a fucking jungler. It's the role that dies, for God's sake, guys, <laughs> and fails all the smites and goes for the hero. Like, so that's already going to be meme city right there. But then the other thing about it is, once they fail, because here's the problem, Monty. If this is El Yoya in that guy's spot, now it's a really interesting lineup. Now let's see what we're cooking with. I don't know about this, because I actually feel like that bot lane, who the fuck knows how that's going to do? <laughs> That's just flip a coin and who knows if that's going to be good or not. So I think this lineup's really weird. I just don't, I don't really get why they've done it. To me, G2 was in the driver's seat in this off season, mate. I thought G2 could have been the team where, like, if I'm rogue, by the way, I just sit. I don't change anyone. So I think that's mad in itself. They let, like, order am they going to exchange it for Shigenda, for fuck's sake. But I think this G2 one is wild. I think they're genuinely in this off season. I'm, I don't, I don't get the moves. <laughs> I, I think the thing that's, I mean, I, I think what happened is Caps re-signed for another three years and was handed the keys to the G2 esports roster. And this is what he wanted uh, for whatever reason, was tired of playing with Yankos, requested a change, requested El Yoya, didn't get El Yoya. So here we are now. Uh, a prediction for you. Here's what my prediction is. Caps will absolutely regret this line. But here's why. Here's my angle. Dude, where the fuck are all the leadership figures? It's him. It has to be him. Yes. Think about it, right? Hans Sam is famously like quite a quiet guy. Mickey X, also not like a super massive personality. The Yike guy is brand new to LEC. And then Broken Blade's more of like a memer than like some like captain. <laughs> I, I think that's the way, that's what they fucked up here, dude. They've let Yankos go, who was the captain he of the team. He was the glue guy. Odoam is also the captain of fucking Rogue. I think these teams have messed up in that angle, mate, because it's one thing I've had to learn over the years. When I started doing the roster move angles, like as a fan, I was just doing it like you would if you were doing like a fantasy team, like we put this guy next to this one. But then I've, over time, I had in elements like can they play the right roles well one of the last things that we need to add in that people don't is is there even a leadership element are they like shot calling voices like I don't know in this team mate like maybe there are and I don't maybe they have some 500 IQ reason there is but it doesn't seem like it on paper it seems like it'll be actually like like a, some somewhat of like a fucking weird roster I don't really know why this why would this be the champion you know what I mean I, as you said earlier, I'm just surprised they gave up Targamas after giving him all that experience, and he was really good. Uh, the longer things went on, huge champion pool, capable of carrying on champions like Senna. From how he played, I, I always thought the assumption was he would become a shot caller, like the key voice in the team. When you look at the way he roamed on the map, I'm like, I don't get it, yeah. Very, very odd. Uh, I'm I'm not super excited about that. Uh, let's quickly move over to LCS because I think those are most of the major moves. Because I need to hear the rant about uh, the return of Bjergsen and Double Lift to 100 Thieves while Unforgiven sits on the B team. <laughs> For some reason, I don't know why this is, right? LCS will sign so many washed players from like Korea. They'll sign people who like were good a couple of years ago, but then they do this repeatedly. There are certain players where like the Unforgiven one's the best example. Like if you sign that guy, what could it what could it possibly gain you to have him on the bench? That's what I'm. That's what I have as an angle. Like either you want to develop him. You still only you only played one year, remember? So you're either going to give him the chance to like test his skills because like. Like, here's what I don't get. As far as I can tell, the way this is set up, the implication is it's just if Double Lift quits or plays really bad. It doesn't sound like it's anything to do with Unforgiven. Like, how does he alter this scenario? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, do, I doesn't even feel like a good faith sign in me. I don't get it. Like I say, unless Double Lift's going to quit the split, like, what, why are we doing this move? I think that's it. I think they don't know if Double Lift is going to survive for an entire season because he has a history of... Uh, just, you know, randomly quitting the team. I don't even know why he wants to come back into professional play. Like It's it's deep. The whole thing is just very deeply confused. I'll give you my theory. <laughs> sure. Right. There's two theories I have. They're sort of the same one, but there's two elements to it. One is just like when Dom does the core streams or when Bjergsen was playing jungle while he was the coach, when you watch the game, you do what we all do, which is because you're not in the game. You see how easy it is and how stupid and boneheaded all the macro players are. And you go, I could do better than that. Except if you're double, if you actually one minute ago were doing that. So it's like, maybe I should come back. <laughs> and then the other angle is this. And this is just one historically I found in esports is enormous. It's just that people have too big egos, so they can't admit it. You've seen this before, Monty. There are tons of people that have a good reason to leave esports. Maybe they don't fuck with the game anymore, or maybe it is too much of a grind, or the money back in the day wasn't enough, or it got stolen from you, or your teammates fucked you up. But here's the problem. Your reason to leave goes away once you spent too much time in the real world. And in the real world, eventually you all have that moment where it dawns on you. 
in the real world, I'm just some guy who used to play League of Legends. I'm actually just kind of a nobody. But in League of Legends, I was... Like, that's the problem. You are someone in esports. So in my opinion, the, the lore is always there for someone to do the one extra year because you just think like... Why do I go back to where everyone knows my name, where I am appreciated, where I can be a hero? Where in this team, look, it's probably not true, but you even have no doubt in the off season they'll have had one of those whack meetings where like him and Bjergsen were like, but if we played together, we would run the league, man. Like, and they've also done that shit, like the one last run. So it's like their last I mean, shit in it. Come on. I, I was, I was going to just absolutely tilt out of my mind if Spica was on this roster and we were going to have the, the 06 TSM yes. run back. Like, really, guys? That's it. Although I did find Speaker's tweet about, like, saying that he was never going to play with those boomers again. Very hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and Spica is uh, is now rumored to be on FlyQuest alongside Impact, Vikla, Prince, and Ayla. Those are, those are the rumors out there right now. Touched on Vikla a little bit earlier. Um, but this is a really potentially very interesting roster that is capable of winning LCS and actually may be good enough to do some damage internationally. Also appears to be pretty well constructed, I have to say. As long as they can talk to each other, that's going to be the question um, with the amount of, you know, I'm not sure what, if Vikla and Prince are here, what their level of English is. Also, how dirty have they done fucking Papa Smithy? They were like, oh, thanks for literally working with like a fucking old half a button and a piece of thread and turning it into like a medieval tapestry and winning <laughs> us a championship. Yeah, actually, we don't need you anymore. And by the way, the next guy gets Bjergsen and double lift. Like, what? Like, what the <laughs> fuck is that? <laughs> Can I have Bjergsen? No, no, no. You get, you get fucking Rioma and like FBI. Like, what the fuck? Like, that's ridiculous, mate. I mean, it's, it, and also, you know, uh, kind of, I would say, kind of a slap in the face by them promoting tenacity and Busio that came through the systems that he developed right yes. alongside these players. But we'll see how they do. Uh, regardless, if these FlyQuest rumors are true, I think that this is a well constructed roster. The thing that we have to worry about with Prince is as good as he was, he was getting funneled like an insane amount of the resources on Live Sandbox. Oh, it was the whole and team playing for him. Yeah, it was absolutely. the whole team. He was the whole team. So yes. is Prince going to be as good in a different meta? That's not Zeri Siver, uh, because that was the last time we saw him in the Korean qualifiers for the world championship uh, that they failed to win. Um, and is he going to be as good when he maybe not be funneled as much gold? Now, he's still probably going to be a high resource player because you have impact. And like, I think impact is really the perfect, just like, He's not Dove levels, obviously, like we saw in Live, Live Sandbox of like Dove is like the ultimate weakest of the weak side top laners. But Impact is a very stable weak side top laner, which should free up some resources for Vikla and Prince. Having the one-two punch of Vikla and Prince as carries is very good. Spica has been good in the past and was suffering on a bad roster, so hard to get a read. It's always difficult to read jungle players or get a read on jungle players when they're on bad teams because so many things affect their decision making and their own performance if you have nothing to work with in your lanes it can be easy to look bad yourself um and then potentially bring over ayla um i think i'm excited to see this roster play also just as a side note lcs fans are going to love prince because prince is actually a shit talker and i think he will that aspect of his personality will be really unlocked by being an NA and he will be quite the character. I think people will find. I do actually think this fly quest team can genuinely contend. It's oh, actually yeah. a pretty, pretty solid team. Not like there are, you know, <laughs> incredible, incredible other rosters within this league, but yeah, I think it's, <laughs> I think they can definitely potentially do something. Um, I think they can win. Uh, when we have like kind of semi washed Bjergsen and double lift uh, with a couple of rookies, doesn't seem like they're going to be doing well. We'll have to see about this Diplex guy on Cloud Nine. I don't know anything about him because I wasn't watching ERLs, but the core of C9 was strong, and I think uh, I think Jensen was was kind of holding them back in a lot of ways, even though he'll be on Dignitas now, but no other real threats. I guess EG kind of one for one. They kind of maybe downgraded a little bit with someday, but then upgraded with FBI. Um, uh, other than Actually, that, the one that you're referencing, the dig lineup's not, that's, that's an interesting one for sure. There's a world where that comes together and it's like a solid team. Yeah. Um, 
I hope that Jensen will put in more time in the offseason because he looked pretty shaky, especially in terms of his active champion pool in the summer split, which was probably a result of him not playing a lot when he was uh, not on a roster. But I hope for the bounce back. I mean, Armut is obviously extremely confusing. <laughs> it's obviously extremely confusing on that roster. I can see it working in LCS though. It's a pretty weak region for tops. That's true. That is true. Let's see what it can do. Um, those are kind of a lot of the major moves. Uh, when it comes to LPL, there's just too much in flux right now. Like all the, I mean, Rookie's still a free agent, Knight's still a free agent, Gala, Doan B, Jackie Love, Scout is still a free agent. There's lots of rumors that Scout might be coming back to LCK apparently. Uh, but there's too many big players that are still unclear. Like the rumors are that, G I guess we can talk about JDG because that's pretty exciting, that which is that amazing. the... Yeah, the new lineup of JDG is allegedly 369 Kanavi Knight Ruler and Missing, which is on paper just insane. Like that is that is instantly I think if you look at teams, that is probably the favorite for the World Championship everything. at the start of this season exactly. for everything. Yes, just yes, too great. <laughs> Especially <laughs> cuz if you think about this, the key context here is it'd already be a great lineup any year, but in light of the fact as we went through those other regions, every region at the moment's having a weird one, aren't they? Like a lot of big names are sort of downgrading or going for rookies or not going for the bigger names. This is sick because what this is is for real. They're going guys for like a super team of like the best players in like every role. Like for this is like a, a real attempt at a super team so like again look like a lot of the night teams who knows if it'll work but man it's exciting <laughs> on paper isn't it <laughs> fucking hell yeah it's really good and so the 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 thing that makes you excited about this is that jdg's biggest flaw was their bot lane underperforming in lane uh during the world championship and obviously ruler over hope immediately fixes a lot of those problems um and the other aspect of this Though that could be a downside is whether rulers Chinese is going to come along at, at a pace that allows yes. him to play at a high level. Fortunately, he's an AD carry, so he doesn't need as much communication yep. as like a jungler. So I think that takes the edge off. Luckily, the, the LPL's downside. pretty familiar, Monty, with just getting a Korean and going, you just left click and we'll sort of do everything around you in this <laughs> team fight. That's kind of some of that formula's worked for them guys a few times, you know, in history, death. Fucking, you know, yeah, yeah. Just, like, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Play Deft, for himself. Won, Deft won his first international event at MSI right after uh, he went yes. to China. And presumably his Chinese was not particularly good at that. Also, time. by the way, one thing I actually heard, I can't remember where I read this. Some like Chinese person, like as in some expert about LPL told me this. They told me that actually it was speculated that one of the reasons 369 looked so much better on JDG than he did on top was playing with Kanavi. So actually that, because obviously if you're a Knight fan, you know, he used to play with 369 in top esports. So actually that even sounds like a perfect matchup. Like obviously the, these have been solo learners in the past and now you're putting them with the jungler that potentially has brought the best out of 369 he did look really good at world so like i think you just look at this team like i said the three traditional carry positions bangers if people don't know kanavi has been an lpl not only mvp but he's been a champion a bunch of times like this this like i mean missing's pretty new but even so he was like having a great first year like this yeah. lineup looks amazing mate this this could be really cool Again, I uh, like the Zerxe thing. I wonder if it's if the jungle moves away from farming. Uh, now, Kanavi's a let's not let's not say he's not a very well rounded player because he is extremely well rounded and he can play a variety of different metas, but he is best in a farming meta. Um, so whether he will continue to be as dominant as he was when we saw, I mean, he was very good at worlds overall. So whether he will be continue to be that level of dominance is another question, but it depends on how the jungle changes go. And remember that we really can't read into what's happening right now in the jungle, because there's still going to be a lot of big tweaks that are made. And it's kind of unclear what riots goals are with the jungle currently and what they want the result to be. It's, it seems like at least right now they want less counter jungling, but that is also a decision that I think might be reversed once professional players start playing, because if the jungle seems really boring, they may make, additional changes to open up some more counter jungling options again. So it's really hard to know uh, is the point. Um, and that's going to, that's why it's always so hard to say in league of legends, who's like winning the off season because general managers are making contract signings without even fucking knowing what the meta is going to be. Right. It's, it's very, very difficult, very difficult uh, in lol. Uh, I think that's, those are, those are most of the big uh, moves that 
that I am aware of at the current point in time. Uh, are there, is there any other rumors you want to discuss? Not really. Like I, I just genuinely, like I said there, I would, I would like your take just on the general overall scene because we know LCS is doing the cutbacks and obviously spoiler. I know no one wants to talk about this on any form of media right now. In fact, you could even argue media right now exists as a direct distraction from this reality. But right now, the world's probably going to be in economic trouble quite soon for everyone, <laughs> yeah. which is, if you know how the world works currently, is going to have a knock-on effect everywhere. So like, I have to say it, part of that does feel like you can feel the, the fingerprints of it on this off-season. Because as I said... Man, there's a lot of sort of downgrades or sort of like weird gambles. Like, like the Gen G's of the world are the best examples. Like, these are the teams where you thought, mate, if there's any team just runs it back again for another year, surely it's like these lineups. These lineups are killers. Like, the idea that after Worlds, you don't have the lineups of Gen G, DRX, T1, Rogue. Like, how are all these teams breaking up? Like, how, <laughs> if I'm most of these teams, I'm trying to keep those exact five, mate, and just run it back again. I mean, I think with in Dom Juan's case, I actually like, well, first off, they can't control Nuggery retiring, right? And Nuggery never really got back into form, he wasn't I would great argue. When he came back to Korea, mate. Nah. Yeah. I mean, he was good, but not like as good, right? So I think the the Kana move makes sense. The deft move, I think, is just a straight upgrade off of Duck Dom. Um, Duck Dom's good, but he's not as good as Deft is. Gen G, I, I think what's important to note is that a lot of these other teams have ownerships or, or title sponsors that are massive corporations in Korea or RT1. So it's like SK Telecom plus Comcast, right? Kia is on board with Dom Juan, so they have more money to spend. But Hanwha is a company that has a lot of money in Korea. Um, and they they are going to they are going to probably make they've been trying to spend for a while and they have spent in the past obviously so it makes sense that they would be um they would be uh looking at at expanding their roster but i think with gen g they don't have like they're more of a team that's built in terms of sponsorship like a a, a western team where they have a variety of different sponsors uh under their brand and in, indeed like you know they were founded by a guy in california right like a lot of their their corporate offices and leadership are based in los angeles and i think that they don't have the huge like mega sponsor like a kt you know a korean based sponsor a name sponsor and that probably affects their, right. their budgets somewhat you know they're independent. They don't have, they're not like T1 where SK Telecom owns a massive state. I don't know how much SKT owns of T1 these days since they merged into the joint venture with Comcast, but it's a lot, right? <laughs> they still own a lot of it and have a vested interest in their own advertising on the league. So they're not going to pull back in a recession, if that makes sense, because this is something they have ownership in. Whereas uh, a lot of Western teams, their sponsors don't have ownership. They're just going to reduce budget, right? Because they don't have equity. Yes. I still think the JDG and the XL lineups are bangers. So I'm very excited to watch those two teams play. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think overall, we're still waiting on the rest of the LCK and LPL rosters. But LEC, at least, I think looks quite exciting. Um, it looks really competitive, actually. The law party, yes. It looks really, really competitive. And I think combined with the new format, uh, where we're actually going to get more tournament-style structures yeah. more frequently throughout the year, LEC is, is going to be really, really good to watch this next year. I'm... I'm quite intrigued by how those series are going to go. And I have to say, I am positive about LCK because at least with LCK, one of the issues was that a lot of the talent was like diluted over rosters. So you got good players like Keen on bad rosters. And it feels like a lot of the rosters are kind of coalescing this time to be pretty strong on paper. At least, you know, the first glance of T1, KT, Hanwha, Damwon are all really good, and Genji will probably still be definitely worth watching with players like, you know, Chovy on it, right? Uh, and potentially, if some of these rookies come along, could still be an outside, an outside uh, contender for a title. But with half the league already kind of set up and looking exciting, and we'll see if the other teams are, are willing to spend, or maybe they're at least they'll, they'll start some development players that could show some, some flashes of interest. All right. Well, that's it. <laughs> we'll uh we'll see you probably for on Summoning Insight for some more roster uh roster discussions in the future as these things settle down. Again, we do some more stuff in the off season as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do some more stuff in the off season. Um 
And uh, again, Wolf and I will be doing some breakdowns on the Korean rosters further, getting his thoughts on a lot of these changes, especially once we see the rest of the LCK teams continue to make their signings. So look forward to that. Once all of the rosters are set, we'll make that content, have a nice discussion, and continue on. So be sure to subscribe here to The Last Free Nation, and we'll see you.